If you would, please turn with me to Psalms chapter 24, which can be found on page 862 in the Pew Bible. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, he will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your hands, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your hands, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Amen. <clears throat> Well, we've had a great morning so far and a great week this week. Uh, our young people did a really awesome job this week, and all those people that organized that. It was not only very neat because of what they did in the, in the community and the houses that they painted and the people they impacted. The really cool thing was these 50 young people from different places really got to know each other and really got to have some Christian friendships, and they had their devotionals and the young men spoke, and they really encouraged each other. It was just really an awesome week for them, an awesome week for the community. Really proud of everyone that uh, glorified God by working in this work camp this week. Uh, we've had some great fellowships going on, which is good. By the way, tonight, after evening services, ice cream social. Bring homemade ice cream, if you will, or just go get you a half gallon or a gallon from somewhere and bring that from the store. We'll have a good fellowship after Sunday evening uh, this evening. <clears throat> I love seeing Adam and all these other young men get up here and read the scripture. Uh, for all you men and young and old, Wednesday nights during the summer quarter, along with our summer series and everything, we're having a men's worship leader class. We want the young men and the older men and everybody to get in here together. We're going to read scripture together. Mike Moore will be leading the class most of the time. Some of the rest of us will help him from time to time about reading scripture, leading prayer, um, uh, uh, presiding over the Lord's Supper, giving little talks, leading singing. You know, Mr. Andy's going to be helping us out with that. So I uh, really encourage you to be a part of that this summer. Now, we all have struggles and doubts. We started talking about this last week. Some people struggle a lot with doubts and misgivings, uncertainties, having a hard time believing certain things that the Bible or the, uh, the, about God, about the church as it's revealed in the Bible. We gave some examples last week of people that were doubters in the Bible and God had a lot of patience with him. Job, he suffered so much, his experiences caused him to doubt the justice of God. Why do the wicked do so well when some of us righteous people, he said, suffer? There was the man with the demon-possessed son, remember him, and he'd been through so many struggles, and, and he said, Jesus, if you can do anything, will you help me? And Jesus said, what do you mean, if you can? Everything's possible for him that believes. And the guy was trying. He said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And Jesus did help him. He was patient with him. Remember John the Baptist, one of the greatest preachers that ever was, and at the end of his life in prison, and, and he's having doubts, and he sends to Jesus and said, are you really the one coming, or should we look for somebody else? That was John the Baptist. If John the Baptist can have doubts, surely some of us can have doubts and struggle once in a while. Doubting Thomas, everybody remembers him. All of these people kept seeking God, and God is patient with seekers who doubt, but keep on trying to seek God. Uh, so today we're going to start out with I Doubt It Part 2. Now, I don't know if you remember, but we have a Doubt It box out there in the foyer. And several people this week put stuff in the Doubt It box, and I thank you for that. And others tacked stuff to my door or came and talked personally and verbalized doubts and so forth or things that they have a hard time believing. Uh, there were several I know that didn't write. For everyone that wrote or commented, there have to be ten that didn't. 
So we're hoping that those, some of those others will do the same thing this week. And if you're struggling with believing something, put it in the doubt it box out there in the foyer. Uh, some people came and said, I doubt the creation story this week. Uh, I believe in the theory of evolution. Some people came and, and said, you know, I just don't believe that God really has that big a trouble with homosexuality. I mean, what's the big deal if, if that's somebody's preference? Uh, some people uh, had doubts. There were two or, two or three different ones that expressed in different ways a doubt about the exclusiveness of God, the exclusiveness of, of Christianity, the exclusiveness of the Bible and the church. Can there really just be only one way? Wouldn't God just accept anybody that was sincere? Uh, there are uh, some that doubt that God is able to forgive them because of the sins that they've committed. Uh, we're going to spend two or three more weeks probably talking about I doubt it. So look for I doubt it three next week. But specifically today, uh, one young person uh, expressed these doubts. Go to the next slide. It says, I doubt that the story of Noah's Ark is true. I mean, that's a pretty fantastic story, right? Worldwide flood. Some guy builds a big boat. All the animals get on the boat. You know, this person has problems with that. Uh, I doubt that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. You know, who did, who did, who did, who did? Well, who did, or did they? And that's what we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, I doubt that people once lived hundreds of years. You know, give me a break. 969 years, Methuselah? What are you talking about, you know? So we can understand some of these things. I doubt that all human life came from Adam and Eve. These are some of the doubts that were expressed by one of our respondents this week. And we're going to address some of those in just a minute. All right, if you're filling out your outline, number one, there are two extreme assumptions about what exists. Say, what in the world does this have to do with Jonah and the whale? It has everything to do with it. Many of us, we don't realize that the reason we doubt certain things is because we have adopted a certain way of looking at things. Everybody has assumptions Things that we assume from the very beginning as we go about thinking about things. And in, in the field of philosophy, there are two basic extremes about the assumptions that people make about the world. And uh, one of those involves a, a extreme dedication to material things. And the other one involves an extreme dedication to non-material or spiritual things. So let's take the first one. Realism. This is point A. Now, uh, most of us, when we use the term realism, we're not using it in this way. Philosophically, realism could be called materialism. You might write that down on your outline, materialism. It's an extreme position which says that only material things, only matter is real. I mean, all things in the entire universe, as far as this assumption is concerned, are, are broken down into gases and solids and liquids. Everything in the whole universe is made up of atoms and molecules and, you know, things like tornadoes even. Though they're airy and spinning around, they're gases and liquids and so forth like that. Then chairs, you know, are just uh, plastics and wood and all those have molecules and atoms. And it's just stuff. Not only is it just stuff, but inanimate matter is stuff without any soul in it. There's no mind. There's no... There's no soul, there's no spirit, there's no being. It's just dead stuff. That's all there is, see? And extreme materialism believes that there's just stuff. Revelation 9, 20 is uh, talking about idolatry, but it says things made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood can neither see nor hear nor walk. Stuff is just dead stuff. And even people, according to this view, are just a pile of matter, material, chemicals, in chemical reaction, and there's nothing home at all except just a pile of stuff. That's all it is. Nothing more at all. Nobody home. The lights are on. Sometimes the lights are not even on. But nobody's home, see, in this view. All right? The other extreme... Now, very few people are, are really materialist to the complete extreme. Some people are. Those that are so dedicated only to the scientific method, listen to what I'm saying, only to the scientific method. Those people are strict materialists. They do not believe that anything exists except matter. That's it, okay? On the other side of the coin, 
there is the position called idealism. Idealism is also not what you think. It's, it's, it's the philosophical position that only non-material or only spiritual things are really ultimately real. You know, uh, this would be that mind, that, that the thinking part, the, the part of, of thinking, willing, deciding, the spiritual part is really the only ultimately real part of man, that this body and all the physical is just a shell, that actually uh, uh, the idea of chair in Plato's philosophy would be much more real than any particular chair because the idea goes on long after the chair is gone and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a, a totally opposite view, and uh, some people, very few people take the view that only spiritual things are real. Now, look at the next slide. Are spiritual things actually real? What do you mean, preacher, spiritual things? Well, like God. God is a spirit, John 4, 24. He's not atoms and molecules. He's not located in one particular place. He's pure mind with a capital M-I-N-D, you know. There's, there's nothing physical about him, see? No man has seen God at any time, so that blows the, the scientific observation out of the water, see? So God is spiritual. Angels, are they not all ministering spirits? Hebrews 1.14, sent forth to do service for them that shall inherit salvation. Demons, spirits, evil spirits, do those things exist? What about the very idea of good? Is good a real thing or is that just some abstraction that doesn't really exist? There are some cultures on earth that believe there's no such thing as good. And by the same token, they say there's absolutely no such thing as evil. That's a total abstraction. Evil doesn't really exist. Do you believe that there is any good that actually exists or evil that actually exists? And if so, how can you believe that if the only thing you believe in is material things? Is there any purpose? Now, think of this word purpose. See, the very idea of purpose suggests intention. It, ex it suggests willfulness. It, ex it, it suggests deciding. So the very idea that there could be any purpose for anything suggests the pre-existence of a being, of mind of some sort. If just matter is real, there's no purpose for anything. It's totally chaos. That's all that there is, see? What about truth? Is that a concept that's real or not? Uh, or is it, is it simply what anybody wants it to be? What about beauty? Is beauty just in the eye of the beholder or is there real beauty? What about sin? See, sin can't possibly exist if there's no God and God is a spiritual thing. Is sin just an archaic concept that, that hangs people up? What about the Holy Spirit? What about the soul? You young people may or may not have done this yet, but... Uh, unfortunately, or, or fortunately maybe, in, in the way that I've chosen to live my life, I've seen many people die. And some people close to me, some people not close to me. It is a religious experience of the highest order to watch a human being leave this life in the moment of death and to watch the transformation that comes over at that instant. What is gone at that moment. Is it only chemical reaction? It is, only, is it only biology? Or is there a non-material spiritual being that has left that shell at that moment? If, you, if you've seen it very much, I think you'd have a very hard time doubting that there's something there. Is there a soul? The materialist, remember this, the materialist, the one that only believes in matter, cannot and does not believe in the human spirit and the human soul. Those that believe only the scientific uh, method is the only way to know anything, they do not believe in the human soul or the human spirit or any kind of an afterlife. Any human being is not worth any more than a pile of dirt out there. That is the belief. They may not verbalize that to you, but that is the belief. Okay. Now, let's go to the next point here. Number two. It, those are the two options for what you assume to be real. Now, how do we know anything is actually true? This is called in philosophy the study of epistemology. That means how do you know anything? Well, there are several ways of knowing, I think. Uh, the first one, which is respected by materialists, is empirical evidence. That's basically the scientific method 
which says that you have to verify everything that exists with your five senses. You have to touch it or taste it or smell it or feel it or hear it. You know, you have to see it. You have to actually put one of your five senses on it to verify that it exists. And then that verification has to be uh, verified by somebody else. That's the scientific method. The scientific method works great in what realm? The physical material realm. It's a wonderful method of, of determining things in the physical realm. But do we assume a priori that nothing but the physical exists? Is that a fair assumption? See, So empirical evidence is one way to come to knowledge in the physical realm. Secondly, there's reason. Logic, you know, if syllogistic logic, if A is true and B is true, then C must be true. Mathematics is kind of a wonderful thing. You know, mathematics is, is kind of a, a, a spiritual exercise based on logic, but it really works and it even has application uh, to the physical. Reason works a lot of times, sometimes not, but reason is a way of knowing. Number uh, next, C, testimony. Uh, lawyers and judges and courts and historians and all kinds of people use testimony. If a person over here says, I saw this, and somebody completely disconnected says, I saw it too, and describes the same thing, and somebody way over here that's completely different says, well, I saw it too, and they describe the same thing. If you have enough corroborated testimony, it becomes very compelling that whatever they're testifying about actually happened or is actually true. But what would you do, young people, if there was really compelling testimony about something, all kinds of testimony, but that it was pointing towards something supernatural? But this testimony was compelling, yet it was pointing towards something supernatural. Well, what the materialist would do, he'd say, we know that supernatural things are impossible, so he'd just reject that no matter how much testimony there was. Is that where you are? Is that what you would do? That's as a result of assumption, see, that we operate by. Then there's intuition. Intuition is that feeling that you have sometimes that you just sense something and you just know it. You walk into a room and you just know something's wrong at the get-go and you can't really explain why. Is, is that a valid way of, of knowing something? It's kind of mysterious. And then finally, there's revelation. See, if there's a God, could that God possibly reveal himself, speak in some way to mankind? God, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, who at various parts and various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets has in the last of these days spoken to us by his son. See, that is the claim of divine revelation. Some people who don't even believe in the Bible also believe in revelation because they believe dead people speak to them. Is that not revelation? That's revelation, isn't it, of a different kind? Other people believe other beings speak to them in revelation. So is revelation possible? See, is that a valid way of knowing? When we speak uh, specifically of Revelation, and you speak of the book that we call the Bible, see, we believe this is the divine revelation of God, uh, there's so much testimony and evidence, internal and external, that supports the fact that this is a divine revelation. Did you know that the Bible, 700 years before Christ, talks about the earth being round, the circle of the earth in Isaiah? Did you know that in Leviticus, uh, many centuries before people realized that life was in the blood, that the Bible says the life of all flesh is in the blood? Did you realize that in Psalm 8 it talks about the paths in the sea and modern mariners didn't figure that out uh, uh, for many, many years? Did you realize that in the Old Testament laws of Israel there are laws of sanitation that, that uh, were way beyond anything people knew up into modern medical times? Do you realize that circumcision was commanded to be done on the eighth day and it's on the eighth day that the prothrombin or whatever it is, vitamin K in the blood, reaches, reaches the point where you can bleed without any help and, and clot effectively and so forth. And the Bible said do it on the eighth day. How would they know all that stuff? Well, that's, there's a lot of internal evidence like that that there was some kind of divine revelation going on. There's also external, revela uh, external evidence meaning there's all kinds of archaeological evidence that supports the things it said in the Bible. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, historical evidence that confirms the things in the Bible. We could go into that and will maybe in another lesson. But the point is, do you accept revelation as a way of knowing anything? 
What are your assumptions? Number three on your outline, everyone has some operating assumptions. And what are yours? Do you believe in only matter or only chemical chaos? Do you believe spiritual things exist? And what are the valid ways of knowing something that you will accept? Okay? Do you accept revelation and testimony as valid ways to know? All right, finally and quickly, specific doubts for today. And don't fold it up because we're not done yet. You know, the, the doubts that we had on our specific handout were uh, the story of Noah's Ark is true. I doubt that. I doubt that Jonah was swallowed by the whale. Next slide there, please. I doubt that people lived hundreds of years, etc. Uh, all human life came from Adam and Eve. Well, if the creator and designer exists, can he intervene in any of this or, or what? Well, let's look at our first one, A. Who did swallow Jonah? What in the world is that beast right there? That beast right there is a, a prehistoric uh, fish that there's several fossils of in, in museums all over the world. It's called Dunkleosteus. And I'll show you some jaws here in a minute. But look at Jonah uh, chapter 1, verse 17 on the slide. The Bible actually says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. That Hebrew word there is a very nonspecific word. It does not particularly refer to any species. It speaks of a great fish. In Matthew 12, verse 40, when Jesus was speaking about it, he says, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. Again, uh, the Greek terminology is very nonspecific. In another translation of Matthew 12, 40 and 41, it says, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so great fish... Sea monster, what exact creature was that? See, the Bible is very unclear as to what exactly we're talking about. Some people have said, well, you know, like the blue whale or whatever, the throat's too small and it couldn't really swallow a man, and if it did, he couldn't live, and so forth. Uh, people have tried to look at this scientifically. Remember, the Bible says, the Lord prepared a great fish. What does that mean? The Lord prepared a great fish. Well, three, three possibilities have been given by scientists or people that have that, that bent. One, some people think it was a great white shark. Now, could you get down in that gullet right there, Jimmy, if he slid up and saw... Oh, you might could. Some of those things are monsters. In fact, they have found whole or nearly whole people in the bellies of great white sharks. Second option some scientists have given is a sperm whale, and they're very capable of swallowing a human being. And some people think that may have been what it was. Other people think that these big fish fossils that we have in some of the museum from these monsters right here, which were very capable of, of swallowing people, could have been the thing. But, but let me ask you this. Even though people that have explored this have said, yes, it is scientifically possible for this to happen. Think of the story. Jonah was running away from God. God was intervening here. And the Bible says the Lord prepared a great fish. No way around the idea that there was some divine intervention in that. But if you assume from the beginning that there's no non-spiritual thing that exists and there's no God and that's impossible from the beginning, then you can't even open your mind to that possibility. So, number one, it is scientific, uh, scientifically possible with the creatures we know about. Number two, why leave God out of it when the Bible says... The Lord prepared a great fish. All right, second doubt. Could the story of Noah actually be true? Genesis 6, 13. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and I'm about to destroy them with the earth. You know, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that the only imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and he said, I'm going to destroy them. See, God is in this story from the very beginning. But, I mean, a great flood all over the world, you know, uh, people getting in a boat. Look at Genesis 6, 14. God said to Noah, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. By the way, that's another of those Hebrew words that's very nonspecific. We're really not sure exactly the type of wood that was. You'll make the ark with rooms covered inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. Next slide. The length of the ark is 300 cubits. Folks, a cubit is from here to here. From here to here. That's 18 inches to 24 inches. Let's take the small cubit. 300 
cubits. That's 450 feet. That's one and a half football fields long. Okay. Then let's take its uh, 50 cubits uh, broad. That would be at the smallest 75 feet wide, one and a half football fields long. And then uh, its height 30 cubits, that would be at the minimum 45 feet tall. So if you could put a three-story building that was 45 feet tall over one and a half football fields, that's what we're talking about here in size for the boat that was built. The uh, Dutch architect Johan Weber has uh, built one of these things over in, in uh, the Netherlands, and this is kind of a replica of it. But what if the kinds that we talk about in the Noah story... You know, he took two of every kind or seven of every kind. What if those were genus or phylum kinds and not necessarily species? Like maybe not every, cert, every single species of mutt, but maybe a few of the categories of canines, a few of the categories of felines, a few of the categories of equines, a, a few of the fa categories of other things, and that all those animals that could interbreed were represented and and he put them in that three-story thing that was uh, as big as a football field and a half, you know. I think you can see that that's scientifically possible. But now, again, let's back up. What about the intervention of God? How did all those animals get to Noah? Didn't God have to intervene there? What about uh, the great flood that came? Didn't God intervene there? What about revealing his will to Noah and even telling him to build the boat? And Didn't God have to intervene there? So if you start assuming that there's no God, you have trouble. But what about the great flood stories that persist around the globe? We've got Babylonian flood stories and Akkadian flood stories and Egyptian flood stories of a great flood, South American flood stories. What about the fossils of sea life that people have found all around, even in the mountains, like in Wyoming, in Casper, Wyoming, in the foothills when they were digging the foundations for Kelly Walsh High School, they found sea life fossils of all kinds way up there in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. How'd those fossils get there? You know, we can go on and on, but there's uh, two things here. Number one, there's a lot of scientific evidence that suggests it really did happen or it's possible. But number two, why leave God completely out of it? What compels us to do that? Number next, C, did people really live hundreds of years? You know, today we live into our 70s, 80s, 90s, maybe. A few, like Johnny Panisi's father, live over 100. He was 106 years old when he died. Look at the scriptures here, briefly. Adam lived 930 years. Seth lived 912 years. Are you kidding me? Methuselah lived 969 years. Give me a break, some people say. That is impossible. Well, let me ask you some questions. Was there ever a perfect world without disease? Was there ever a time when, when God created the heavens and the earth and man and God were one when there was no pain and no sickness and no disease at all? And if there was a perfect gene pool and no disease, then what would have compelled man to die young or early? Did you realize that today, Cambridge University geneticist Aubrey de Grey has stated this outlandish statement today. He said, the first person to live to be 1,000 years old is probably alive today. Whether they realize it or not, barring accidents and suicide, most people now 40 years old or younger can live for centuries. Now, this is the statement of a geneticist that realizes that with, with a couple of little tweaks, the human uh, gene is capable of people living a long, long, long time. But what if the gene pool was perfect in the beginning? Would this geneticist need to even do anything? You know, could it be possible there? How long did it take disease and decay after the fall of man, after man sinned against God? How long did it take disease and decay to impact the human lifespan? How many generations did it take for people to begin living less? You know, in Genesis 11:10, when you look at the genealogy after the flood, the lifespans began to get drastically smaller in a very short order, in a very few generations. And what about what scientists called the greenhouse effect? If it really didn't rain, which the Bible teaches, until the flood and there was this canopy of, of moisture around the earth, uh, 
could that possibly have caused uh, longer lifespans and larger specimens of plants and animals? There's a lot of questions there. But again, it's scientifically possible, and why leave God out of the process as well? Next and last for this time, did all life come from two people? I mean, look at all the races in the world and everything. Did all life come from two people? Genesis 3.20 actually says, Adam called his wife Eve. Why? Because she was the mother of all living. So according to the Bible, all people really did come from those two people. Now, there was an article that I read this week, because this, some of these questions you guys are asking are way above my pay grade, and I was trying to do some research, but uh, this one that has to do with uh, Creation Ministries International says this, according to the Bible, all humans on earth today descended from Noah and his wife. The Bible tells us that the population that descended from Noah's family had one language, and by living in one place, they were disobeying God's command to fill the earth. This is Genesis 11:4. God confused their language, causing a breakup of the population into smaller groups, Genesis 11, 8, and 9. Modern genetics show how following such a great breakup of population, variations in skin color, for example, can develop. The Bible teaches that there is only one race, uh, ultimately, the human race. And uh, Acts 17, Acts 17, 26 says, He made of one blood all nations of men. Did you realize, go to the next chart there, that in the D DNA of human beings across the entire globe, there is only two-tenths of one percent variation in the DNA of all human beings. In other words, we are 99.8 percent exactly genetically identical. There's only 0.2 percent variation. Now, see the little pyramid thing, the little triangle? That is that two-tenths of a percent variation broken down further. So of that two-tenths two of a percent uh, variation, 85% uh, of that tiny variation is within local ethnic groups, like within Cantonese people. So most of the variation that exists in that two-tenths of a percent is in the same race. Then 9% of that two-tenths of a percent is between ethnic and linguistic groups like between Cantonese and Japanese or Japanese and Korean or something like that, only 6% of that two-tenths of a percent, and that's an infinitesimally small degree, see, is variation actually between races, like between Asian and Caucasian. So there's almost no difference. Did you realize many times that a, a person of a different race is a better tissue match for somebody wanting a kidney or something than the person of their own race. So really, it's in completely possible for what God says to happen. This is a great article if you want to read about it a little bit more. Now, I know we didn't answer everything in there, but let me finish with this, with this statement. Whatever you doubt, and we're going to talk some more about some of these doubts next week. Do you doubt it because the evidence really compels you to doubt it, is that really why you doubt it? Or, and I think this is more true than we really like to admit, do we doubt it because the assumptions that we're working with to begin with force us to doubt it because of the way we're looking at things? I hope you'll pray about that and think about that. And I also hope you'll keep putting your stuff in that box out there and telling me about the doubts and we'll keep preaching a little bit. Next week, I doubt it. Part three, if we can help you to trust in the Lord, if we can help you to obey the Lord's commands today, we would love to do that. Please come as we stand and as we sing.